May 1800, a former British soldier named James Hadfield tried to kill the King of England. Hadfield fired a horse pistol on King George III as he entered the Theatre Royal in London. He missed. But Hadfield didn't care. The delusional assassin was convinced that his own execution for the crime would bring about the second coming of Jesus Christ. It didn't. But it did bring about a revolution in the criminal law. An enterprising lawyer saved Hadfield from the hangman's noose. And the man who had tried to shoot the king was found not guilty of treason, by way of insanity. That case is the granddaddy of all modern-day insanity defenses, including a present-day massacre that led to the longest prison sentence in U.S. history. This is Roger. 315 and 314 for a shooting at Century Theaters, 14300 East Alameda Avenue. They're saying somebody's shooting in the auditorium. Copy. All available units respond to the theater. Somebody is still shooting inside theater number nine for an employee. Yeah, all of our RPs are saying theater nine where Batman was playing. We got another person outside shot in the leg of female. I got people running out of the theater that are shot in room nine. Christine, I got seven down in theater nine. Seven down. Do I have permission to start taking some of these victims via, via car? I got a whole bunch of people shot out here. No rescue. Yeah, blow them up. Get them in cars and get them out of here. It was one of the worst mass shootings in American history. 12 people killed and 58 injured, 70 victims in all. So many, the police turned the back seats of their cruisers into makeshift ambulances. But this mass shooting, perpetrated in a movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, was different. James Holmes, the killer, survived. I'm Sean Braswell, and this is The Thread. Each season, we unravel the stories behind some of the most important lives and events in history to discover, essentially, how one thing leads to another. This season, we revisit some of the most high-profile criminal cases in history through the lens of the controversial legal defense that binds them together, not guilty by way of insanity. We will see how this remarkable thread of insanity cases grows out of the trial of James Hadfield in 1800 and continues to impact the law today. We begin though with that mass murder in Aurora, Colorado. Some of the details you're about to hear are horrific, but they were key to helping the jury in the case determine if the defendant was out of his mind at the time of the shooting. Five minutes after midnight on July 20th, 2012, 24-year-old James Egan Holmes strolled through the front doors of the Century 16 movie theater in Aurora, Colorado. He stopped to hold the door open for two fellow theater goers who entered after him. Holmes calmly walked over to a kiosk and picked up his ticket for the late night showing of the new Batman movie, A Dark Knight Rises. He wore dark baggy cargo pants and a slightly crooked baseball cap that covered a mop of dyed orange hair. His hair was perhaps out of the ordinary, but there was nothing on the surface to distinguish Holmes from the dozens of casually dressed young men there to see the latest blockbuster about their favorite comic book hero. Holmes entered Theater 9 and took a seat in the front row of the packed auditorium as the film started. I knew Harvey Dent. I was his friend. And it will be a very long time before someone inspires us the way he did. Minutes later, Holmes pretended to take a phone call. He left through the theater's emergency exit, careful to prop open the door behind him. When he returned from his parked car to the theater, it was 38 minutes past midnight. This time, he wore dark body armor and a gas mask, and carried a shotgun, a high-capacity assault rifle, and a handgun. This is Dr. William Reed, a court-appointed psychiatric expert in the Holmes case. He walked into the theater from the screenside exit, threw the tear gas grenade across the theater, and he began shooting, primarily uh, first with the shotgun. There was a moment where my daughter tripped, and, and I just pulled her up, and I was just dragging her, and I was just thinking, we just got to get out. Just Even if I just got to get out the doors, and even if I just fall dead, just, just get my kids out of here. It was, it was just so horrible. Holmes walked slowly up and down the theater aisles. He fired at random people with his shotgun until it was empty. 
Then he dropped it and began to fire with the assault rifle. Suddenly, his rifle jammed. He couldn't get it to unjam and left the theater. He decided, in his words, the mission was over. He calmly walked out of the theater. He actually walked through some victim's blood as he walked toward his car. Police found Holmes waiting for them in a white Hyundai sedan parked just behind the theater. They took him to Aurora Police Headquarters and placed him in a bare interview room to await interrogation. Holmes is calm, detached. An officer puts little paper bags over his hands and tapes them to his wrists, a way of preserving gunpowder residue. Holmes plays with the paper bags as if they were hand puppets. Because Holmes surrendered, lawyers, psychiatrists, and the American public were given a rare chance to grapple with a mass murderer directly, to glimpse inside the mind of someone who is both mentally ill and highly intelligent, to try to understand how an honor student named Jimmy from a loving family could transform into a crazed killer. James Holmes's crime was horrific, and there was no doubt that he had done it. The question, rather, was why. Colorado prosecutors sought the death penalty. Holmes' lawyers fell back on a controversial criminal defense, that he was not guilty by reason of insanity. And they painted a picture of James Holmes that was very different from the photos of the young man with orange hair that were all over the nightly news. To understand why his lawyers chose the insanity defense, we need to go back to his childhood. All right, our next speaker is James Holmes. Six years before the Aurora shooting, then 18-year-old Holmes gave a presentation to fellow summer interns at the prestigious Salk Institute in La Jolla, California. He just graduated from Westview High School and will be attending the University of California, Riverside. His goals are to become a researcher and to make scientific discoveries. It's a good start. In personal life, he enjoys playing soccer and strategy games, and his dream is to own a Slurpee machine. <laughs> These kids have been fun to work with this summer. Holmes approaches the microphone. He's a skinny, geeky-looking kid with big ears and a mop of hair brushed over his forehead. He wears an oversized button-down shirt, untucked. He is bright-eyed and, like most of us asked to give a presentation before a packed room of our peers, he is nervous and a bit awkward. Well, the lab I work in is the Computational Neurobiology Lab, or CNL for short. That's right. James Holmes was not only a smart kid, he was an aspiring neuroscientist. My mentor, John Jacobson, who works in CNL, is a philosophical type of guy. He's interested in how we perceive reality. He also studies subjective experience, which is what takes place inside the mind as opposed to the external world. I've carried on his work in dealing with subjective experience. There was a reason James Holmes was interested in this area of research and why he wanted to be a neuroscientist. He knew something was wrong in his own head. He referred to it as his, quote, broken mind. There was nothing particularly unusual about him in his early years. Dr. William Reed again, a court-appointed psychiatrist in the Holmes case and author of A Dark Night in Aurora, inside James Holmes and the Colorado mass shootings. He went to school like everyone else and was particularly smart, thought very well of by his teachers. The young boy from San Diego, California, known to everyone as Jimmy, had a very happy childhood. He had loving and attentive parents. His mom, a nurse, and his dad, a statistician, had met at Berkeley. Still, something dark lurked under the surface. As he entered adolescence, he noticed that something felt wrong about the way he got along with others and some of the thoughts in his head. Holmes started to keep to himself more around the sixth grade. He heard noises hammering on his walls at night. He started to think about killing people. And over the next few years, those thoughts and fantasies became more and more specific. He would see particular people dying or see things that he described as nuclear winter or atomic bombs. He sometimes would even see saws cutting off people's heads. By high school, Holmes began to think he might be crazy, but he wanted to understand why, to try to fix his broken mind. He believed there was something wrong with him, but still, in high school, he did very well. He easily got into uh, college on a scholarship. Holmes continued to excel in college at the University of California at Riverside. He was a Dean's Fellow. He graduated with honors and a nearly perfect 4.0 GPA. He was accepted into the neuroscience graduate program at the University of Colorado. And in 2011, just a year before the shooting, he packed his white Hyundai and headed east towards the Rocky Mountains. He did very well 
for the first six months or so of grad school. The professors there and elsewhere will tell you that being a little eccentric isn't a bad thing for graduate students, particularly in sciences. They didn't mind the fact that he was a little odd because most of the other grad students were a little odd too. And Holmes did things that perfectly normal grad students do. On Valentine's Day 2012, a mere five months before the shooting, he made his girlfriend a candlelit chicken dinner at his apartment. They watched Netflix and ate ice cream. But underneath, Holmes's broken brain was getting worse. He was behind on his studies, left the laboratory early. He started to see things at night, shadows that weren't there. In addition to his schooling, which he continued and continued to pass, James thought more and more about ways to kill people and began to plan specific ways to kill them. He called this his mission and the mission was to kill as many people as possible so that he could collect their points. Holmes called those points human capital. His delusion uh, is a very strange one. It's hard even to know how to describe it exactly. Richard Bonney is a professor of law and of medicine at the University of Virginia. He became increasingly preoccupied with the idea that his worth as a human being could somehow uh, be increased uh, if uh, he would kill other people. And he thought killing other people might lessen his depression and suicidal thoughts. Again, William Reed. He told me that it was about a 50-50 chance. So he was willing to kill others on the 50-50 chance of feeling a bit better himself. But so far it was just feelings and talk. Holmes sought help and was referred to a psychiatrist named Lynn Fenton at the Student Mental Health Clinic in March. He told Dr. Fenton about his thoughts of killing, but withheld his views on human capital and denied he had any specific targets or plans to kill. Based on what she heard and the fact that Holmes had no history of violence, Fenton prescribed him medication for anxiety and depression and scheduled a future appointment. Almost everyone that I talk with or that I read about uh, wonders why in the world nobody put James Holmes in the hospital. Uh, the reason is quite clear. Our laws, our civil rights laws and mental health laws in every state make it very difficult to take away a person's right to walk around, to hospitalize them against their will. Meanwhile, Holmes's outward life started to match the chaos of his inward life. His girlfriend left him. He failed his second year exams and he dropped out of grad school. Over the next few weeks, James Holmes hurtled toward disaster and the moment he would change thousands of lives. By June, his mission to kill as many people as possible consumed most of his time. He picked a target for his assault, a location designed to maximize his kills. He began to purchase weapons, ammunition, and armor. And then, one warm evening in July, it was time to execute his mission. And finally, he brought together all of his uh, body armor and, and ballistic uh, clothing, his weapons, which included an M&P-15 uh, rifle, which is much like an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle, a shotgun, two Glock handguns, and a great deal of ammunition. And then he got in his car and drove, without incident, over to the theater. Up next, the trial of James Holmes. The Aurora gunman was clearly disturbed but would it be enough for him to be deemed legally insane? When it's time to make a hire for your small business, naturally you want to find the best person for the job. Odds are that person is on LinkedIn. Here at Aussie, where we weave each season of the thread, we depend on LinkedIn jobs to help us find the right person for our hiring needs, to put top talent at our fingertips. LinkedIn jobs makes it easy to get matched with quality candidates who make the most sense for your position. It goes beyond the resume, using knowledge of both hard skills and soft skills to match you with the people who fit your business the best. Your LinkedIn jobs matches are based not just on skills and background, but also on interests, activities, and passions. Matching lets you quickly get a group of the most relevant, qualified candidates. That way you can focus on the candidates you want to spend time talking to and make a quality hire you're excited about. Post a job today at linkedin.com thread and get $50 off your first job post. 
That's linkedin.com slash thread. Terms and conditions apply. A disturbing story that has been sealed away in court for three years came pouring out today. This is the first day of the trial of James Holmes. Holmes's trial in 2015 returned Aurora to the national spotlight. The prosecution filed 166 criminal charges against Holmes, including 24 counts of murder and 140 counts of attempted murder. The district attorney made it clear he would seek the death penalty for Holmes's heinous deeds. 400 people filed into a box-like theater to be entertained. And one person came there to slaughter them. His name is James Egan Holm. He tried to murder a theater full of people to make himself feel better. Holm sat at the defense table in a dress shirt and slacks, his hair trimmed short and no longer dyed orange. His lawyers from the Colorado State Public Defender's Office did not challenge that their client had committed the atrocity. What the case really came down to, they said, was what was going on in his mind. There will be no doubt in your minds by the end of this trial that Mr. Holmes is severely mentally ill. None. Why was Holmes' state of mind so important? The insanity defense. Most crimes aren't actually crimes under the law unless the defendant intends to do something criminal. Criminal intent is required to commit a crime. If there's no criminal intent, there's no crime. Andrea Alden is author of Disorder in the Court, Morality, Myth, and the Insanity Defense. For as long as we've had civilizations with law, systems of law in place, there has been some sort of understanding that certain people don't understand the law due to some sort of mental defect. A recognition of this fact of the importance of understanding the law when it comes to guilt is widespread. In the days of the Roman Empire, defendants were sometimes found not guilty because they were non compus mentis, meaning without mastery of mind. William Reed again. Some version of an insanity defense has been around for centuries, even for thousands of years. Uh, the Jewish Torah and Talmud uh, speak of not holding people responsible for things that they do when they're uh, out of their head. The process, if you look at it carefully, is perfectly reasonable. We don't convict four-year-olds of murder if they find a gun and accidentally shoot their playmate. Richard Bonney again, a legal scholar who has written extensively about the insanity defense. So I think that basic intuition is that it's not fair, right, to blame someone when their capacity to choose to do the right thing uh, has been fundamentally undermined, you know, by a psychotic process over which they have, you know, no control. In other words, the subjective reality of defendants like James Holmes matters. The psychiatric idea here is that as the person becomes increasingly focused and driven by something that's not true, but uh, is what they believe to be true, and they become, you know, uh, detached from uh, the, the reality of what they are doing, they are also becoming detached from the moral uh, reality, you know, of what they are doing. But how do we tell when someone like James Holmes is sufficiently detached from reality to lack criminal intent? How do we know if he is indeed insane? Keep in mind that insanity is a legal term, not a medical term. You would never be diagnosed by a psychiatrist as being insane. In other words, the legal concept of insanity is different from the medical or psychological concept of mental illness. William Reed again. In fact, most people who are mentally ill are quite responsible for their acts and quite competent to do various things like go to work and drive a car and and, uh, uh, sign a contract or, or raise their kids. The point for the insanity defense is, is there, as a result of significant mental illness, an absence of the ability to understand what one is doing, understand that it's wrong, uh, and adhere to the, to the right, if you will? Legal insanity, in most jurisdictions, boils down to this question. Did the accused understand the difference between right and wrong at the time they committed the crime? It's a simple question, but one that has proven almost impossible at times for lawyers, judges, juries, and even psychiatrists to answer. The case of James Holmes was no different.
Could listening make you a better parent, a better leader, even a better person? Could listening inspire you to start something new? There's never been a better time to start listening on Audible. Audible has the largest selection of audiobooks on the planet. With Audible, you get access to an unbeatable selection of audiobooks, including bestsellers, mysteries, thrillers, memoirs, and more. For listeners of The Thread who love history, I recommend you go to Audible and pick up Bearing the Cross, David Garrow's Pulitzer Prize winning biography of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. In season three of The Thread, about the history of nonviolent protest, we drew a lot from Garrow and his work on Dr. King. Audible members can choose three titles every month, one audiobook and two Audible originals you can't hear anywhere else. Listen on any device, anytime, anywhere, at home, at the gym, on your commute, or just on the go. Audible, the most inspiring minds, the most compelling stories, the best place to listen. Get started with a 30-day trial when you go to audible.com slash thread or text thread to 500-500. That's audible.com slash thread or text thread to 500-500 and listen for a change. The mystery of any insanity defense trial is what was happening in the defendant's mind at the time uh, that he committed the crime for, for, for which he's being tried. This is Lincoln Kaplan, a senior research scholar at Yale Law School and an expert on the insanity defense. And you can't get inside someone's head uh, in, in the way uh, you could if, if we were machines and we had tape recorders for brains. The trial of James Holmes provides a recent and powerful example of the challenges of climbing inside a defendant's brain and some of the evidence that can be used to decide whether they knew the difference between right and wrong. The prosecution set out to show that Holmes knew exactly what he was doing. First, his lengthy preparations for the slaughter did not seem to be the actions of a man who was out of his mind. Holmes stockpiled firearms and thousands of rounds of ammunition at his apartment for weeks. He practiced shooting at firing ranges. He read up about explosives. Holmes also took disturbing selfies of himself. In one taken just days before the shooting, Holmes, with his hair dyed bright orange-red, wears black contact lenses and grins diabolically into the camera like a comic book villain. The prosecution also pointed out another key piece of evidence. The public got a first look today at a key piece of evidence in James Holmes' murder trial, a notebook the defense hopes will help prove he was legally insane when he opened fire in a Colorado movie theater. Holmes mailed the spiral-bound notebook to his psychiatrist, Dr. Fenton, just hours before the shooting. It contained about 30 pages of often disjointed writings and illustrations. William Reed again. Some of the things he wrote look crazy. Some of the things he wrote look like plans for the shooting. Some of the things he wrote uh, look like philosophy and thoughts about life, including his own life. Holmes spelled out his theories of human capital using logic, math, and stick figure drawings. He called it insights into the mind of madness. He tried to diagnose his own mental illness and admitted he was powerless to fix it. He wrote, so anyways, that is my mind. It is broken. Neuroscience seemed like the way to go, but it didn't pan out. In order to rehabilitate the broken mind, my soul must be eviscerated. One of the things that was in the notebook that was very interesting was evidence that he considered a number of different ways to kill a lot of people, a number of different venues, including but not limited to movie theaters, evidence that he cased the cinema in Aurora carefully to find out which of the auditoriums would be the best one in which to uh, commit the killings. The prosecution emphasized how Holmes used the notebook to plan his attack. Defense lawyers, on the other hand, argued it was proof of just how extensive Holmes's delusions were. So looking at the notebook gives us a little bit of a window into how he was thinking or believing at a certain time, but it really doesn't describe Holmes in any accurate or consistent way. One cannot look, in my opinion, at that notebook and say, oh, here's a person with a severe mental illness such as schizophrenia. The evidence was inconclusive on the subject of Holmes' state of mind, and like so many insanity defense cases, it came down to the insights of expert psychiatric witnesses. Andrea Alden. In order for you to use your mental illness as a mitigating factor in a criminal defense, 
You're obviously having to talk about your mental illness in a legal setting. And then you're also going to need medical experts or psychiatrists or psychologists to come in and testify on your behalf. There were four such experts in the Holmes case. Each agreed that Holmes was delusional and that his behavior was traceable to his mental illness. Richard Bonney. So in that particular case, as is often the case, you, you have fun, you know, basic agreement about the seriousness of the mental illness and about the psychotic process that's going on. But what there may be some disagreement about is what the degree of detachment you know, from reality uh, was. The first three experts, one for the prosecution, one for the defense, and one court appointed, deadlocked about Holmes's psychosis. So the judge appointed a fourth highly regarded expert to help. Dr. William Reed, who you've been hearing from this episode. I went to Colorado and interviewed Holmes at the uh, Colorado Mental Health Institute at Pueblo six times, and a couple of weeks later interviewed him three times at the jail uh, in Aurora. So I spent almost 24 hours with Holmes over time, all videoed so that there's no question of what I said, what he said, what he looked like. The video of those interviews was played for the jury on a television screen in the Arapahoe County courtroom. For the jury, the video is a brief look inside the mind of the alleged killer, taken during a mental evaluation to help determine whether Holmes was legally insane when he opened fire in a Colorado movie theater. Holmes appears calm in the video. He speaks in a monotone voice, but he seems to understand the questions being asked by Dr. Reed. How did it feel to be really doing it? Um, then it was an autopilot. Exhilaration or? No, none of that. Caution or? No. Were you aware of what was around you or? Um, yeah, I could like see people trying to leave and sitting down and under their seat. William Reed again. My diagnostic impression was that he had something we in the profession call schizotypal personality. That's a serious mental illness, but not one in which people are routinely psychotic, that is, lose, lose contact uh, with reality. And I did not believe that he had lost contact with reality at the time of the shootings. Reed believed Holmes was mentally ill, but he did not think his illness prevented him from having criminal intent, from knowing the difference between right and wrong. Holmes planned everything that he did. He planned it very carefully. He practiced it. He planned a diversion. He planned ways to get away, although he didn't try to get away. He told me and he told other people that he was aware that his victims would not have wanted to die, would not have wanted to be shot. Holmes knew the killings were illegal and wrong. He knew law enforcement would try to stop him if they discovered his plans. Holmes carried out his mission deliberately and with knowledge of the consequences. We believed that in spite of his serious mental illness, that illness did not remove his legal sanity for purposes of being tried uh, for a crime. The Colorado jury agreed. After deliberating for just 12 hours, they found Holmes guilty of 160 counts of murder and attempted murder. He was sentenced to more than 3,000 years in prison, the longest sentence in American history. A single holdout juror was all that kept Holmes from getting the death penalty. The judge's final words as he closed the trial were, Sheriff, get the defendant out of my courtroom, please. Cheers erupted as Holmes was let off to jail. The sentencing of James Holmes brought some closure to the victims of the Aurora shooting and their families, and he deserved to be held accountable for his crimes. Still, says William Reed, he would not have committed them if he did not suffer from a broken mind, if he were not mentally ill. How in the world can someone who kills 12 people and injures another 58 and leaves a terrible tragedy in a theater at midnight, how in the world can that person be viewed as sane in any reasonable sense? Part of that determination comes down to appearances and the impression made upon a jury. Holmes had bright orange hair and wild eyes in his initial public appearances. He looked like a madman. But he looked like a very different person three years later when he sat in the courtroom in a nice shirt and glasses. Andrea Alden. 
One of the problems with understanding mental illness, particularly for lay people, for jurors, for judges, um, is that if you don't conform to the physical outward appearance of what we think quote unquote crazy should look like, then we cannot accept that you might be so mentally ill that you committed this crime as a result of your mental illness and not just because you were a bad person. The prosecution argued Holmes knew the difference between right and wrong which is the standard for insanity under Colorado law. But is just knowing that your actions are against the rules enough to be deemed sane? Did that make Holmes more bad than he was mad? Richard Bonney. So he had a, a grip, you know, at some level on the reality, on the moral reality and the legal reality or the criminal reality of his conduct. What he might not have been sufficiently in touch with reality is to know in a deeper sense to appreciate the moral enormity of what he was doing. And somehow, the more delusional he got, the more, you know, the, the moral interests and the human interest and the human connection of the people who would be his victims, you know, the, the, the less that meant to him. The James Holmes case showed us how hard it is even for a severely mentally ill defendant to win with an insanity defense today. But to better understand why that is the case, and how the insanity defense has evolved through time, we need to travel back through time to the first major case to address legal insanity. Back all the way to another James, James Hadfield, that British soldier who tried to kill the king back in 1800. Our journey back to James Hadfield will take us through some of the most compelling and horrifying criminal cases in history. Cases that push the bounds of public opinion, scientific understanding, and the law. Up next, episode two of this season's thread on the insanity defense, we'll consider a case from the early 1990s. One of the reasons that defendants like James Holmes have a tough time proving legal insanity today was the public outcry that followed earlier high profile cases. Cases in which defendants who had committed shocking crimes were found not guilty by reason of insanity. One of those defendants was Lorena Bobbitt. She went to the kitchen, she sees a knife, she grabs it, um, she goes back into the bedroom, and, you know, the rest is sort of history. She cuts off his penis while he is asleep. What Lorena Bobbitt did to her sleeping husband, John Wayne Bobbitt, captivated the country in 1993. And it revealed a public divided over issues like domestic violence and sexual assault. One more willing to laugh at an inexplicable tragedy than to face up to it. But to see it on the news, what happened to him, very funny. <laughs> really hysterical. And when it came to Lorena Bobbitt's insanity defense at trial, it revealed something else, that what looks like justice may have little relationship to the law. Thread is produced by Robert Kulos, Sophia Perpetua, and me, Sean Braswell. Chris Hoff engineered our show. This episode features Oten Vargas with a song called Back to Insanity. To learn more about The Thread, visit aussie.com slash the thread, all one word. And make sure to subscribe to The Thread on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on iHeartRadio or listen wherever you get your podcasts. Check us out at aussie.com or on Twitter and Facebook. If you love surprising, engaging stories from history, look no further than the flashback section of Ozzy.com. That's O-Z-Y.com.